Hey everybody, how are we doing? Hey Beth DeBoer, how are you? Nice to see you. Howdy ho. There's Nancy Wright and Lisa Tatinas. David Lee, good to see you. Mr. Bob Watts. Hello, my friend. Susan Olson. That's great. People are uh, pouring in here. That's very good. I just was on uh, tech support with Mr. Paul Nelson trying to make sure we get uh, all the people in that signed up. We got a lot of people signing up. So hi, Ina. How are you? Joe McCourt, Jojo. Very good. We're going to get this going. We're going to give everyone a couple extra minutes to kind of get some stuff squared away. Paul's trying to open up the registration and make sure that everybody that was supposed to get in got in. So uh, for those of you that are here, cheers. I hope everybody's doing all right and doing pretty uh, Miss Rich. Nice to see you again. Gloria Stewart, Beth DeBoer, cheers. Had to go with some flannel, Lisa. I mean, we're going to Maine. I need some flannel, need some fire, need some beer. I was going to wear my main, uh, my main uh, hat even, but I decided to uh, keep it to just flannel. Mr. Peter Ewan, how are you, sir? <laughs> me too, me too. This whole being stuck at home and on top of that, it's a dank, cold, miserable. Melissa Marsh is going to go with wine, wine and fleece. Well, whatever works, whatever works for you. Me too, Anastasia. I'm glad you and Dave. Tell David I said hi. All the way from uh, New York State. Uh, you cannot, Beth. Everything's kind of limited. If we have a second moderator come in, they can address them, but it's too much going on with if I unmute everybody. And if we start seeing everybody's comments and screens, it gets to be pretty wicked out of control. So, Bernadette, if you've got no audio, that's on your end. Um, that is a beer I am drinking, Mr. Roy Haddock. Very nice to see you. Extra cheers for you. Extra cheers for you. Keith Bauer, all the way from New Mexico. You're gonna to get to uh, Wayne Justison, and that's in your end, sir. So uh, uh, it's gonna be something you've got um, uh, on your end where you've got your uh, sound somehow skewered off. Chris Karam, uh, no, this is not a main beer. This is a UFO white, which uh, I'm not sure where it's made, but I just know it's good. The uh, we are uh, going to go just we're going to give us a little. I wanted to get going right at 705 sharp, but uh, Michelle, you're still Mickey Dungas. It's outside Atlanta. It's 60 and windy. I'll take 60. You can keep the wind. So it's got to be uh, anybody that can't hear me. Um, it's definitely. Uh, uh, let me see. Hold on here. Let me see if I can type this since you can't hear me. All right, so I just sent a note out to to a note out to everybody. So hopefully that makes sense. There you go, Wayne. Good. All right, see Roy, fine connoisseur of UFO whites. All right, Mr. Mark Santucci, good to see you. Ralph McKechn. Ryan and Jill Denzi. Nice. Good to see you. That's uh, that's an important addition uh, on a personal level. Ryan and Jill are family members that uh, don't get to see too much of what I do. So this will be kind of cool to show them around my little place in Maine that uh, one way or another they've heard a lot about. So well, we're going to give this to uh, about uh, um, I even have uh, my lovely wife, Kate, even join us tonight. Her family's going to join, and my mother-in-law, and all these other people, hopefully. So that'll be pretty cool. I sound like Miss Jane from Romper Room. Holy smokes. I'm not sure that sounds like a good thing. I better, I better get my main twang on, right?
yeah the uh uh jimmy pierce all right very cool very cool jimmy pierce good to see you and jimmy i'm uh pass along my very sincere condolences for you and your family so cheers my friend Man, Mickey Dillon says, where in Maine is Solon? That's the big question tonight, Mickey. Where in the world is Solon, Maine? Um, waiting supper on this class. Can eat later. So that's great. The uh, Maine, uh, you know, obviously big state, but Solon, Maine is pretty much right smack in the middle. About, uh, oh, 45 minutes southwest of Bangor and about 45 minutes northwest of Augusta. Hey, Bernadette, how are you? Muffy, good to see you. All right, well, I'm not so sure. Paul's still working on trying to get more people in. Um, so I'm not sure what the holdup is, but we're gonna be going through a bunch of images tonight. Uh, so we're gonna kind of get this going and uh, see what kind of ground we can make. Let me see if I get any other. Let me see. All right. All right, let me close. All right, so what's going to happen? The way we're going to go do this is, hey, Muriel, how are you? There, near, near Reefield, uh, not, not too far, not too close. But as they say in Maine, you can't get there from here. So uh, Reefield is not too far. That's more a little uh, inland, uh, excuse me, uh, coastally a little bit more, um, probably by about 45 minutes, actually. So. Um, but anyways, let's get this going. We're going to be covering some ground tonight. Tonight, the purpose of tonight is just to relax, have some fun for some information. I'll do everything I can to throw a little bit of uh, photography information out there to to uh, help people out. But uh, this is just a good way for us to get out of the house tonight. So uh, let me close down the question box. So what's going to happen in the question box is once I close it, uh, I won't see anything until we open the webinar up at the very end. Uh, and then I can answer questions. And what I'll do is I'll read the questions out and answer them as they come up. Um, but we're gonna get rolling because we've got uh, we've got some ground to cover. So let's shrink this down. Let's shrink this down. And let's get rid of my webcam because nobody really wants to be looking at me that much. And there is my screen. All right, very good. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is my favorite place in the world. Uh, my name is Don Toothaker. I'm the director of photo adventures at Hunts Photo and Video uh, uh, here in New England uh, with the, the principal primary store being in Melrose where I work out of. Uh, this is my third year working there full time. I've been there for about 11 years altogether. Uh, several years just part-time in sales and some education stuff but a couple of years ago we started off this full-time program of education including uh, local national and international workshops and uh, they're designed to be very hands-on teaching instructional hopefully inspirational and helpful uh, photography workshops and uh, when we kind of sat down after several years of talking about this and finally made it come to fruition one of the things I suggested was, you know, we know we have a good following for Hunt's photo as far as a retail store, but we weren't really quite sure where we stood as an educational uh, option. And um, so I threw the idea out there. I said a good test is going to be if we do our first workshop in Solon, Maine, which no one's heard of, it is going to be a really good uh, gauge of where we stand on people's radar for getting information about education, being interested in education with us, um, and if it was going to have validity that we could keep carrying on. It was probably going to be easier to, you know, sell out a workshop in, you know, Grand Teton National Park um, by virtue of its selling point of being Grand Teton National Park. But Little Soul in Maine in my log cabin, aside from me posting it on Instagram and Facebook, nobody ever heard of it. So, um, that's one of the reasons why I want to do this tonight. I want to do this for me personally because this is my favorite place in the world. It has a tremendous amount of obviously very intimate and personal meaning for me uh, from a family level. Um, but more importantly, uh, or equally importantly, this is where my photography began. This is where, you know, my curiosity of everything in and around the cabin 
led to me needing to answer questions for myself about many, many things, uh, much of which involved photography, obviously. So um, welcome to the cabin. Welcome to Saul in Maine. Uh, let's take a nice little trip together, all right? So just a little bit of background. Uh, Saul in Maine is, it's pretty small. You know, it's a drive through town. There's no real industry here. Uh, it's located in central Maine. It's about 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes northwest of uh, Waterville and Augusta. Waterville's biggest claim to fame is Colby College. Augusta is the capital of Maine, so it's not too far off. The largest local town is Skowhegan, Maine, um, which is at a crossroads at Route 201. It's on your way to Sugarloaf Ski Mountain. Uh, and most people uh, have never heard of Solon, but they drive through it anytime and every time they go to uh, the forks for whitewater rafting, or if you're driving the main route to go up to Quebec, uh, you're gonna go through Solon. Uh, you're gonna pass through that one blinking light in downtown next to the general store. Um, Population is only about a thousand. Uh, I'm not even sure if that's a thousand year round residents, but um, that's about it. It's pretty spread out, pretty small. There's, there's no real industry here. There used to be, you know, we're on the fringes of the Great North Woods, so there was some carryover to the lumber industry, uh, but all that's kind of evaporated in the past decade or so. Uh, so pretty much anything and everything that has anything to do with industry in and around Solon, it's got everything to do with outdoor recreation. Uh, we're right on the Kennebec River, so there's a tremendous amount of fishing, certainly a lot of hiking, hunting, um, exploring. Uh, it's still very much a rural uh, area with some farming, but not nearly as prominent as it used to be. Um, and like I said, it's kind of like a drive through town. Um, and I'm kind of okay with that. I like it being a little bit uh, off the beaten track and not too overrun with people. So, you know, uh, it's a typical country town. It's full of country features with old homes. It's uh, There's some new building going on, but Mostly that's out-of-staters building camps or second homes or whatever it might be, but most of the primary houses in and around town are these old, beautiful, you know, Victorian country farms or country homes. Uh, pretty much wherever you go, it's, uh, you know, it's the heartland of, of Maine, so you see a lot of patriotism. Uh, you can see a lot of representation of the American flag and small little symbols like that that are beautiful. Um, Old farms, you know, this one particular, I made a comment, you know, this is, you know, nobody rebuilds barns anymore. They're too expensive. Uh, and the people put a brand new metal roof on this, which means they want it to stay, which is really cool. And it's up on one of my favorite hills overlooking one of the valleys. Um, agriculture is still very popular. There's a lot of farms. They grow a lot of stuff for, you know, sale for produce, a lot of farmers markets. Obviously, they grow a lot of uh, grain and corn for livestock. Uh, but again, they all make beautiful backdrops for your photography as you travel around. Um, one of the old farms, unfortunately, this one's kind of gone, um, but some of the remnants of its history are there, which always make for great photos. And of course, you know, every town has these little, you know, one-stop shops uh, that attract all sorts of people for gas and cigarettes and beer and God only knows what else. And they make great photo subjects in the middle of the night. Again, driving around, I love to find small scenes like this. You know, it's uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about the influence this has had on my eye as a photographer and my knowledge as a photographer, and particularly my growth as a photographer. These are just things when you repetitively drive around, I look for little small scenes of life, if you will, and uh, I just love these. This is one of my favorite images. And there it is, downtown Solon right there. Don't blink. This is, uh, you know, on 201 North, there's the one blinking light in town. To the right is the, uh, uh, the Solon Hotel, which has been there since the 1800s. It's literally like an old Wild West bar at times. And right across the street there is Bates Bullets and, and Bait, where you can buy either Bait, Bullets, or Bolts. And next to that's the general store. And that's pretty much it for the whole downtown, for the most part. Uh, and of course, like every town, uh, it's full of people. and they're very industrious people. Um, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, they say. So pretty much anybody up here, they, they work hard with their hands. Certainly they're smart people and resourceful, um, but it's very necessary to learn how to do a lot of things yourself. So you can find a lot of people that, that, that you know, they might do more than one or two or even three jobs. Um, 
people fix things, they repair things, and most importantly, they help each other out. This gentleman is the uh, kind of the overseer of the uh, uh, the local community house that we're going to look at uh, in some pictures in a little while. This is Kevin. He's the owner of the Bates Bolton uh, Bullets downtown. He let me do a portrait of him one day. He was an interesting guy with his beard, and he's now retired. And this is uh, probably one of the toughest strongest, smartest, most resourceful human beings I've ever met in my life. This is my Uncle Bob, and he's sitting in his cabin that he built by hand. Every single thing you see right down to the uh, the walls and the cabinets and the table is all handmade and uh, all done with wood right from his own property, um, done probably 90% by himself with his own hands other than the 10% of help he got from people lifting things and doing stuff. And uh, he's about 80 years old right now, and I still wouldn't hang him. He's a classic, uh, classic man. A little bit about uh, the cabin. Uh, the nickname is Tooth Acres Acres. Uh, we, my parents purchased the land in 1985, uh, excuse me, 1986. I typed that wrong. Uh, construction on the cabin began uh, that same year as far as just clearing land. We, it's off of a big paved road, but we cut our own road down into the woods so that our cabin would sit down uh, kind of away from any traffic or whatever it might be. My parents bought a kit. So if you can just imagine Lincoln Logs for adults, that's all it was, was just uh, uh, an unbuilt fabricated kit that got delivered on the back of an 18-wheeler and dumped on the side of the road. And it was simple as, you know, north one, east one, west one, south one. That's where the logs went. And then two, three, four, and you just kept going until you built this, uh, this four-walled and uh, windowed, doored, structure and we paid to have a roof put on it we paid to have the platform that it sits on because we couldn't do that kind of work but we pretty much did everything else my mom and dad doing the majority of the work um and like any property it's a tremendous amount of work and because it sits in the middle of the woods and it's in the middle of mother nature uh mother nature works harder and faster than we ever will so it's a constant constant cutting of, of brush and cutting of trees that suddenly you know, it seems like overnight spring up from, you know, eight feet to 30 feet. And um, so there's a lot of work to be done all the time, but it is literally a labor of love by my parents, by myself. I have two sisters. Um, neither one of them, you know, go that often. Uh, that's not to say that they don't like it or enjoy it. It's just that they don't go that often. Um, I have two brother-in-laws. One, I don't know if he's ever been, maybe the month or twice, but I have one brother in law and, and my nephew who love it there and they use it quite a bit so we all share in it uh at this point my my dad's 89 years old my mom's 84 years old they're both very very healthy but they don't go up there that much and they certainly can't go up there and do the work like they used to so that kind of fell on my shoulders a few years ago and i'm very happy to uh uh to say that it's uh like i said it's my favorite place in the world so like anything that you love working at it is never really work so but what i want to talk about quite a bit is, you know, I'd owned a camera in 1986. I bought my first camera when I got stationed in England in 1986. I, I didn't, I, I did not even put film in it. And uh, I had to teach myself how to do that with the help of some friends, Chip Miller in particular, and Kevin Shives and David Garfield when I was stationed at Alconbury and Mr. Ian Proudfoot. Um, and they kind of helped me get going, but everything was on automatic. And I, I, I just enjoyed that. I documented my life. I had fun. I was very curious about the camera. Uh, it wasn't until um, the land that um, I started to just be really curious about everything that was in the woods. And I wanted to photograph things in the woods. And automatic just wasn't working out so well. So I had to start figuring things out. And there was a lot of frustration and a lot of horrible failures. But whenever I had successes, it was, a, it was a, a magnified thing that just pushed me forward faster and harder every time I had a success. A success. So it just fueled my determination uh, to become pretty good at, at what I did at, at, here at the cabin. And there it sits. That's what it uh, looked like uh, two summers ago. Uh, the fence has subsequently come down and I replaced it with a new fence. But that's my mother's very famous stone wall, which has been relocated around the property probably four or five different times at this point. And uh, she does it all by hand, one rock at a time, up and down the road, which is 250 yards long. Um, so she's pretty tough. In the background there, you can see some white buckets with some uh, 
some tree stumps in it, and I'll explain those later on, but uh, that's the cabin. Um, it's rustic, it's not big, it's uh, got two bedrooms, uh, you know, a, a full bath, uh, a kitchen, a stove, it's got everything you need. It's got all the, all the essentials you need. Uh, we heat it with a wood stove, which is incredibly wonderful and awesome. The only drawback to a wood stove is it has two speeds, either on or off. Um, so there's no real regulating the heat, so it can get pretty warm in there, and at the same time, on a cold night when it's drafty, it can get pretty chilly in there. But um, for the most part, it's really quite snug, very comfortable, and uh, it's pretty cool. And the first thing you always have to do when you go to the cabin is make a fire. So let's just have a fire. I love fires. Uh, I love the smell of campfire wood. Um, I like the sound of it. It just adds to the aesthetics of of everything that goes on there. So you're going to see a couple of videos shot with my iPhone to add in here. But uh, um, getting right into the heart of the thing, you know, my parents were were incredibly ambitious and fixated on the cabin, and I certainly was too in its construction. But my mom and dad really did the majority of the work. At that time, I was stationed in northern Maine. I was in the Air Force. I'd come down and help out, uh, and that went on for a few years. Um, but I immediately fell in love with the woods. I've always loved the woods of Maine. Um, long tradition in my family of being outdoorsmen, hunting, fishing. Um, I always loved that. It was always uh, just transfixed by the beauty of nature. Um, the power of nature, the, the curiosity of nature. So I was immediately drawn uh, to the 64 acres that my dad had bought. And uh, I was determined to explore every single inch of it. And uh, I have probably a thousand times over. Um, Mother Nature keeps changing it. And I keep trying to change Mother Nature. And it's a little bit of a symbiotic relationship we have. And Mother Nature wins. Uh, but I like to try. But uh, my curiosity for everything sprung from these woods behind the cabin because my background really was more hunting and fishing and just being outdoors um i labeled myself a nature and wildlife photographer once i started figuring things out and um that label seemed to fit given the environment that i was spending most of my time in uh i enjoyed it and i wish i had oh a hundred dollars for every time I walked in the woods with my longest lens, which you know back then was probably a 70 to 300 or something like that, and I stepped over so so many amazing scenes that I didn't bother to photograph because I was a nature and wildlife photographer predominantly. So I'm sure I stepped over you know generations of of wildflowers and insects and small little attributes of nature that were beautiful because I was in. Uh, pursuit of other things that were either you know on four legs or had feathers and wings like this uh, spruce grouse uh, you know nesting this is a hen she's sitting on a, 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 some eggs right next to our road uh, pretty much they always make a nest in this spot every year they return to the same nesting spot quite often as long as it doesn't get disturbed and of course all of the wonderful creatures in the woods I just I, I'm in awe of what lives there and, and what goes through there, you know, transient wise or what lives there um, uh, year round. Uh, several years ago, we had a fox family that lived out back and uh, they must have moved on. The den got pressured or something, who knows. But we had one, one spring where I was fortunate enough to see the family of foxes and it was difficult to photograph them, but still um, an amazingly incredible experience to see these beautiful wild animals just steps outside the door, so to speak. And some little screech owls at night, you know, you, you sit in the cabin you, in the summertime, you leave the windows open and you can hear the sounds of the wilderness. You hear coyotes, you hear moose, you hear owls. Um, and it's just a wonderful thing to sit at nighttime and listen to these things. And then of course, in the, in the daylight or the available light, it's just an incredible thing to go hunt them and hunt them in a different way than I used to. And uh, I'll hunt them with my camera to preserve the memory and the feeling of seeing these wild animals. Um, I wish I could really adequately describe how exciting it is to see something wild in its wild and natural environment and get to photograph it. And it's mine. It's, I'm not on a trip somewhere to 
some far off distant land like the Grand Tetons or any number of the places I go like New Mexico for wildlife. These are my own woods, literally, like I said, feet from the front door sometimes. And of course, you know, I think I've probably seen about a million deer, white-tailed deer at this point in my life. And every time I see one, it's like the first time. Um, they're just beautiful, graceful animals to see. This is a young buck. This is this is shot. This photo was taken in the uh, in the springtime. You can see the velvet on his horns, uh, excuse me, on his antlers. And anybody that doesn't know the difference, antlers fall off every year. So the deer family, moose and deer, they drop their antlers, they shed them every year, and they grow back. Uh, horns are permanent. You know, like a cow or like a bighorn sheep, they stay permanently, but they continue to grow. But uh, these are just magnificent animals to see no matter where you see them. And then of course in the springtime this is a very special occasion when you get to see a different perspective on life, the beginning of life. Um, young, beautiful, innocent, weary, uh, unfortunately incredibly susceptible to the dangers of life, just life, just like the rest of us. Um, and when the, uh, you have the opportunity to see one and photograph them, all wild animals, you should photograph them at a safe distance. You never, ever want to disrupt their natural lives or their patterns or make them feel threatened or endangered. And I would say you want to be just that much more respectful of young, of babies, because they're learning. They don't know. They don't know the inherent dangers. Their, their instincts haven't sharpened to the point of uh, fight or flight. So a lot of times they just sit still and uh, that's not good for them. And we don't want them to become ever habituated to people. And then of course, there's always the option, the opportunity that just maybe you start to see the biggest mammal in the woods of Maine, which is the moose. Uh, this is a very young bull cow uh, in the springtime. He's probably, you know, last year's, uh, you know, uh, baby calf. Um, he's probably, you know, five or 600 pounds. Uh, this particular spring when I shot him, you can see the horns, uh, excuse me, the antlers that are just starting to grow. Um, and, you know, like any wild animal, you have to learn their behavior, you have to learn the threshold of where to be with a wild animal. So his ears are up and his eyes are fixed straight. Uh, a moose, when he starts or he or she starts to get agitated, the eyes will roll and the ears go back. And when that happens, they're telling you, you're, you're too close, you're bugging me. Um, so you need to learn uh, nature, learn nature's um, words and, and, and actions without knowing words. And that's an important process in my growth as a photographer, getting to see all these things in the woods and studying them and making mistakes, getting too close to a moose who, who pawed the ground at me and grunted at me and lowered his head. And all of a sudden I realized I'm too close. He's not trying to hurt me. He's just telling me I'm too close. Same with a bear, same with a deer, same with an owl, same with anything. So the more time you spend in the woods looking for these things and understanding them, you, you become a better you know, naturalist. And to be a better photographer, you first have to be a better naturalist uh, to understand the behavior and, and the uh, environment of things so that you can find them, so that you can enjoy them, so that you can keep yourself safe, but also keep them safe. And then this starts to play into other things, the lessons learned uh, in your special place. And, and I do want to take a moment and say, like, you know, I'm very, very fortunate. I don't think for one second that I, I pretend that I'm not. Um, this beautiful cabin, all its woods, is a product of my parents' hard work and selflessness to, to you know, buy this and build this as a family retreat. and. Uh, it's something you know that they've enjoyed now for 36 years, and as have I and my sisters and my my family, and I will continue to enjoy it as long as my uh, body lets me do the work, and hopefully uh, my children will, will get to enjoy it uh, for a long time as well. So we'll see, but um, I would hope that everybody has an opportunity to have a special place, and it doesn't have to be a cabin in the woods. It could be a particular bench. Uh, at the ocean's edge, it could be a pond, it could be a state park, it could be a national park, it could be anywhere. Um, but it is my greatest hope that everybody has a special place to go to. That is a place where they can go to sit and think and reflect and slow down and, and digest the things that life throws at us. 
Um, I think everybody needs a place like that. And I think it's important for everyone to do everything they can to forge that. Um, I was fortunate in the way it happened for me, uh, as was my, as my wife. It was fortunate the way it happened for her. They have a house at the beach. Um, but one way or another, everybody hopefully can find that little place. So um, back to the woods and the lessons learned. So I was so fixated on being a wildlife photographer um, that as I spent more time in the woods, I learned that I really didn't want to be any one thing because the more time I spent in the woods looking for wildlife, I began to notice and appreciate so many other things on a large scale and on particularly on a small, subtle scale. Um, so that's my encouragement. That's where that comes from. When I teach classes and I talk about, um, you know, uh, being a photographer, I advocate for just being a, the best photographer you can be. And don't put a label on it, like portrait photographer or wedding photographer, because the buttons you push for everything pretty much are the same. The application is a little bit different, obviously. Um, but I think it's a good thing to be as good at as many things as you possibly can. And just like a nice old comfortable flannel shirt, some things are gonna fit a little more naturally and easier than others. Um, but do your best to be as good at as many things as you can. Uh, it is really fun to learn. I'm almost 55 years old now, and it took me a long time you know, to, to accept uh, that learning was a really fun and good thing. Um, and I guess that comes with a little bit of growing up and experience and seeing things outside uh, your particular world. And sometimes when you travel far, you have a greater, uh, more dramatic and poignant appreciation for what is nearby and, and what is yours. And that's what happened with me. The more that I just was determined to get away and see things because I thought things were better elsewhere, it, it made me more uh, cognizant of the fact that it was the best right here. Um, and that's a good thing. And then of course you learn all about the things that go along with it. And, and, and one of the greatest lessons you can ever learn uh, in photography is having patience. And I'm not always a patient person when it comes to just life in general. I'm not always patient when it came to uh, comes to photography. Uh, true story, you know, uh, my dad uh, hunted deer for 60 years in Maine. Uh, I hunted deer for 30 years in Maine. Neither one of us ever shot a deer. My dad just had no interest in doing it. And for me, I didn't have the patience to invest in what it took to really hunt. Um, uh, so anyways, uh, I tried to make sure that when I started to learn photography, I tried to shed some of my impatience so that I would have better results. And it, it is paying off, but it's still a work in progress. But as I made my way around the cabin still, and I realized as I wandered into the woods and I drove all the logging roads and, and I went to all the streams and the ponds and the lakes nearby, exploring and exploring endlessly, I started to realize that my own little 64 acres or my family's own little 64 acres and right in the yard itself, there was so much to see and do photographically, visually, just for enjoyment. Um, I loved birds. Uh, I think they're beautiful. I think they're fascinating. I love little chickadees, which is the state of Maine state bird. Uh, and I would go tromping through the woods trying to photograph birds all the time. Well, one of the most wary animals in, in the, the wild world is, is birds. They, you walk up on them and they fly away. They never sit still. And I was always chasing them. And then I finally started to realize well, how can I make them come to me? And I started to build these natural bird feeders uh, that you saw in the white buckets. I just find some old logs in the wood that, that, are, that have been broken off naturally. I want everything to look uh, natural. And uh, I usually take, you know, the tip of the chainsaw or perhaps one of my drills with a, like a great big bit on it. And I drill holes into it and I try to make it look as natural as possible, like it was created by a woodpecker or some other animal. And I fill it with suet and I fill it with bird seed. And they come right to them, and I just sit in the cabin uh, using the cabin uh, window as a blind, or I do have a portable blind I put outside sometimes, and I just sit, and I get these wonderful, beautiful colored photos of these beautiful birds, a blue jay, a woodpecker. They come, and they just hammer away at these natural uh, uh, bird feeders that I designed. Uh, the finches, depending as they migrate through, they're very much a spring and early summer bird, but they're beautifully, beautifully colored. And I also set my bird feeders up so that the background was completely clean. So again, learning the lessons of photography that photographing in the woods is 
the main woods are just a tangled mess. So everything's obstructed. There's always things in the background sticking up or sticking out or sticking through, and it's very hard to get a clean photo. Well, when I set these bird feeders up, which anybody could do in their own yard, I just made sure they were in a spot where everything behind it was either far off and not a bright color uh, and nothing that would ever be distracting or in, uh, interruptive to my photo. So I have this beautiful little photo studio right from the cabin or from my little blind uh, that these birds flock to. Uh, when I'm there often enough, birds very much, I don't know how they know, but when I show up and I go out and I start putting bird feet in, they all show up and it's wonderful. And of course, that brings other visitors. Um, you know, the red squirrels come, red squirrels and gray squirrels don't mix, they don't live together. So our woods have a lot of red squirrels, uh, which are very noisy and chattery, uh, but they're beautiful. They're a beautiful color. They have funny little uh, mannerisms and they make for wonderful subjects. So again, learning a lesson that, you know, these I wish the squirrel would go away because as long as the squirrel's there, the, the little goldfinches won't come. But then you just have to accept that this is what's being offered to you and it is a beautiful subject. It might not be the most glamorous subject or the most colorful subject, but it's still a fantastic subject. And then of course you get really dramatic light uh, at different times of the day and other little critters come out. These are the chipmunks and it's pretty hard not to like a chipmunk, right? I mean, seriously. And in my mother's uh, stone wall, she calls them her pet snakes. Uh, little garter snakes are harmless. Uh, they're not venomous. Um, uh, they, you know, they're about a foot long at the, at the most. Um, they, they're a cold-blooded animal, so they love to be warm. So they love to climb out on the rocks and lay in the rocks during the sunlight. So if you're out in the yard in the summertime, quite often you walk along the stone wall and see two or three of these guys laying out there. And the minute you walk by, they, they slither off. But Every now and again, they'll sit still enough to make a pretty good, interesting photo subject. And then there's all the little subtle, small details that you start to notice as you open up your mind and you open up your heart to different possibilities and you, you get over yourself that you're not just a wildlife photographer and you start paying attention to all the beautiful colors. My mother's lily of the valley that she transported from our family home in Linfield and she dug a hole in the ground up at the cabin and threw a bunch of the stuff in there and it's taken and grown for years. And it's a tremendously beautiful, wonderful smelling small plant. It's only about maybe, I don't know, four or five inches off the ground. So again, I'm getting myself down into the dirt. Eye level is the best way to photograph your subject almost always. Um, so you have, to, you have to be humble. You gotta be willing to get dirty. You gotta be willing to get a little mucky, get a little buggy, um, be uncomfortable. Um, and I say it all the time in the, in the classes and the photo walks we do, if you're willing to make yourself uncomfortable, more often than not, you will be rewarded. It's the making yourself uncomfortable that's difficult. The, taking the photo once you're down on the ground or kneeling down in the, the edge of a, a pond where your knees are getting all wet or whatever it might be, it, it, that's the difficult part. The executing the photo is not. It's being uncomfortable. So as long as you're willing to uh, put up with a little bit of discomfort, you'll be rewarded. Uh, I put this one on Instagram today with a funny little story. The, the, every May, the yard, if you will, uh, at the cabin fills up with these wildflowers called bluets. And uh, they're, they're my favorite little wildflower. I think they're just absolutely beautiful. They're delicate. Uh, they only grow about you know, four or five inches off the ground. And quite often, it looks like a blanket of snow when you look out the window on a spring morning. Uh, and the chipmunks, when we have them in residence, uh, they're very active. They always come and go from the bird feeders. Um, and I was determined one day to get a photograph of this chipmunk, this one very hyperactive chipmunk, and he or she would run through the bluets and every now and then it would pop its head up to look around to, to make sure it was safe and there was no predators coming, hawks, it's a big open area so the hawks and the owls might get them. Um, and I kept trying to move my 500 millimeter lens or guess where he was going to pop his head up and I try to figure out the different path he was using, he was kind of using the same path and he's started to realize he always stopped in the same spot. So then it was just a matter of waiting and making a lot of mistakes before you get one great photo. And there's the bluets. And being down low to the ground, looking at things differently is again, here's, here's where part of the lesson, part of the self-teaching comes in. I used to read so many stories in outdoor photography and other photography books and, and so much of it made sense until I went to do it. And then it kind of went out of my head and I just kind of went with whatever I was doing. 
But again, uh, success sometimes comes from repetition. So laying down on the ground to take pictures of these bluets, it started to make sense to me more about what people said about isolation of your subject or separation of your subject or looking your subject um, uh, in the eye, uh, not having any distracting elements to take away from your subject. Um, one of the things I used to read about all the time that you know years ago, this gentleman by the name of Ian Proudford used to say to me, if you can't find, I can't remember his exact words, but it's if it, he used to say something to the effect, if you if you can't find a good way to look at something, you're not moving your feet enough or something like that. Uh, and that's what I try to say to people is like change your perspective all the time. We make this huge habit uh, mistake in our habits uh, as photographers and as people that we stand around and we wait for other things to change. And that's a huge mistake. You know, the easiest thing to change is ourselves. Um, we just don't like to do it. We don't like change, so particularly with ourselves. So we wait for other things to change. It's really important to get down on the ground and take a look at something one way, take a look at it a different way, and find other ways to still say the same thing. It's all the same subject. And all I'm doing is literally crawling around the ground with my bean bag and my macro lens, and I'm just changing the way I look at things. I'm taking the same subject, and I'm just giving it a different presentation each time. And Suddenly, when you realize, when that when that dawns on you, when the meaningfulness and the mindful of this mindfulness of that dawns on you, and you realize that's what I have to do with every subject, not just with some little wildflowers. That's what I have to do if I shoot a wedding. That's what I have to do if I shoot pictures of a deer. That's what I have to do if I shoot a golf tournament or landscapes or architecture. You have to just constantly be trying to figure out how to reshape your subject with a different presentation and a different perspective. And then with that type of, let's say, inspiration, then you go back into the woods. You know, I would go into the woods and I look for these wild animals. Well, suddenly I was infused with this curiosity about what else was in the woods that I was missing, that I had never changed my perspective on. And you started to go in and you realize on the white pine trees, this is the, this is the new growth and they make wonderful little details. The woods out back um, are, you know, loaded with lady slippers and you know i remember the first time i ever discovered these lady slippers there were hundreds of them in the back part of the uh, i call it the swale right out behind the cabin and we had pink ones and we had white ones and i remember telling my mom we went out and we looked at them and we were like these were amazing i thought they were the most delicate beautiful flowers i'd ever seen and i went back up like i don't know like a month later with my camera and i was all excited to go out and take pictures of these these lady slippers and there were no lady slippers and that's when I said, okay, well, if I'm going to photograph lady slippers, I have to learn about lady slippers. I have to know when they grow and where they grow. And I gave myself an education. They love acidic soil, so they love to grow underneath or near pine trees, which are incredibly acidic, white pines being the most acidic of the pine trees in Maine, and then followed by hemlock. Um, and they really like the slope, something about to do with the, the way that their roots grow and the runoff of the acidic soil. They love slopes, and they like to be underneath things. And they bloom late May for the first couple of weeks of June. And then that beautiful little slipper kind of fades away uh, and they, they don't come out again for another year. So uh, now I know that when I want to photograph lady slippers at my cabin, I need to be there, you know, at the earliest would be like, you know, Memorial Day weekend. That would be if we had a mild winter and a pretty warm spring. But if we've had normal conditions, that first week in June until the third week in June, the lady slippers are rich and vibrant and abundant out back. Um, and that's one of the reasons why last year I did the, the first year we did a workshop there, it was in the fall. The second time I did it in the spring and I try to time it around the arrival of the lady slippers. And we missed by, oh, probably about a week. We got a couple, but uh, not a lot. And this year, if every, if this horrific uh, mess that we're in right now lifts and we get to go do this next workshop in June, which will be in Solon, uh, I timed it. So it'll be right smack in the middle of June so that we'll get some of these lady slippers out there. They're beautiful. And then the woods are full of amazing details, just small, sweet details. Um, and when you really think about it, that's what life is made up of. We again in life, we you can't spend your whole life, you know, trying to win a lottery ticket. You know, I mean that's a wonderful thing, but life is made up of a million little tiny things to add up to one great big life and moment. 
And photography is very much the same thing. You've got to be willing to just look and seek and take comfort uh, in the small things um, and not kick yourself that it wasn't a bigger moment. And again, just beautiful wild geraniums and gardenias out back. Um, and of course, as I tromp through the woods and I learn more about the woods, uh, I've always been a, you know, a fixated with water. I love the ocean, I love pools, I like swimming, all those things. And I realized how much I loved water in nature, that no matter when I was out doing photography, I was always drawn. If I could hear a stream, I would end up next to it. If I knew there was a stream, I would end up next to it. If there was a waterfall to be found, I was going to find it and go explore it. I love water. I think it's a fascinating thing. It's a, it's a huge metaphor for life, and it's an amazing thing to photograph. So as I tromped around in the woods, uh, I'd really be so happy when I found uh, scenes like this, and this is a common scene in the woods of Maine, moss-covered rocks, twisty, windy, gnarly streams, uh, with all sorts of debris from the woods hanging around. This is seasonal, you can tell it's fall. But it happens throughout the, the year, you know, it could be winter, spring, summer. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. They all different looks, different times of the year, different temperatures, basing on the on the, the shadows in the woods or the light in the woods. So it all translates into different stories, uh, which is what we're after, really. We're all after stories when we're you know, taking photographs and creating images. And of course, like I said, that led me into the curiosity of bigger things. And uh, I found that one of the towns nearby, Bingham, features this waterfall called Houston Burke Falls. And I'd read about it in it wasn't in the main gazette, which is, you know, if it wasn't in the main gazette, it wasn't any good, really, is the way I used to look at it. And it was barely noticed in there as a blip. And I think way back then, uh, it was kind of like forgotten about. And so the first times I ever went here, you never saw any people hiking, you never saw anybody swimming or fishing or anything. It was, it was just a complete place of solitude. Uh, it's on the map now, unfortunately, and uh, it's got a big sign out on the road where it is. So it's quite often you go in there, there's a lot of other people. Um, but it's a one of my favorite destinations and up there to go do photography. And again, you start to learn. Um, you know, you get there in the heart of the summer like this, this was taken in August. Uh, this waterfall is about 55 feet high and about 60 feet across. Well, the summertime with a little bit of uh, um, drought conditions, the feeder streams are small, which means the waterfall is small. So you get there with these visions of grandeur and then you realize, oh, it's not quite as dramatic as the last time I was here. And it's very easy to say, oh, bummer, I'll come back another day. Um, but that's not the right approach. The right approach is to take the lesson and learn from it. And that is to work with what you have. This is the scene when you walk down, you cross over. Usually you can't cross over to the side that I'm standing on, but the water was so shallow that you could. And then you just start to work with what is given to you. You have to change your perspective instead of waiting for it to change for the better, so to speak. So you just take your lens and you start to dissect the waterfall. Instead of shooting in its an enormity and its, and its full capacity, the lesson is to just find little pieces, little snippets of it that are beautiful and abstract and unique and dramatic. And you dissect the waterfall. We start picking this part, little pieces that are wonderful to photograph, wonderful to see, wonderful to listen to. Uh, and you sit there and you realize how much power you have as a photographer. The power is not in the waterfall. The power is in me. It's based on the way I see it, the way I feel about it. Uh, again, I'm, I, I can't afford to just go back in two months when it might have more water in it. What if it has less water? I have to make the most of the situation that I have right then. And it's a wonderful lesson to all of a sudden have the light bulb in your head go off and say, okay, I'm here now. I have to do the best job possible with what I have. And you just sit and practice your exposures, your long exposures, your composition, understanding what happens with long exposures, um, the minimalistic of it, the, the mystical of it, uh, fun to play in black and white. This is where black and white, uh, this particular waterfall is a place where black and white study really makes sense to me uh, as far as visually seeing it before I took the photo, because you could see the white water and the black rocks. It was built in contrast. And these little light bulbs started to go off in my head about, I get it. I see the contrast in the landscape before I take the photo. And I understand the monochromatic features of the landscape before I take the photo. And 
too often in our black and white photography now, it's reactionary. We take a photo, then we go to the computer and we edit it to see what it might look like in black and white. Well, I don't wanna figure out what it might look like. I wanna know what it's gonna look like before I take the photo. So this was a great learning experience for me when it came to black and white. And then you go back when there's a lot of water <laughs> and it's a completely different place. It's a completely different scene. It is loud, it's dangerous, it is epic. Uh, it's an enormous, powerful, mystical waterfall uh, full of movement and action and detail and sound. Uh, it's overwhelming and it's an overwhelming place to be and to photograph. You can see now I'm standing, this is on my 70 to 200, probably at about uh, 80 millimeters. Uh, I have to stand far downstream because the spray coming off the waterfall is covering me and my camera and my lenses. Uh, but I also wanted to get the enormity of the waterfall compared to what you saw in the very first image. Uh, and this was incredible. This, my first experience ever at this waterfall, this is what it was. This is what I just assumed it was like all the time. And then you learn. And again, you start to play with exposures and pieces of things. And this is where I taught myself how to use neutral density filters. So back on this image here, Here's a time when I'm on my 7 to 200, the water is moving so fast that the shutter speed, if you look at the water down below, it's not a lot of blur. It's maybe one second, maybe uh, two seconds, but that's how powerful and fast the water on the waterfall is moving. It's moving at such at a rapid pace that two seconds renders it as this as the cotton candy look. And I'd go back, and this is where I would put on ND filters, neutral density filters, which are nothing more than like putting a pair of sunglasses on your lens to purposely prolong the exposure. And this is where I sat one day determined with a variety of filters and I taught myself what was gonna happen when I used a six stop filter, what was gonna happen when I used an eight stop filter, what was gonna happen when I used a 10 stop filter. And you start to get these very ethereal, weird, crazy, dynamic, um, images of this moving water that doesn't look real. Um, there's so much mist, there's so much movement that it just, it looks like white pillows, if you will. And if it wasn't for the, uh, the, the different uh, striations of the rocks and the layers of the waterfalls, it'd be hard to pick it out maybe as moving water. So it becomes very abstract. But this is where neutral density filters, for me, suddenly made complete sense. I understood them completely. And from the, this day, when I went home and edited these photos at the cabin, I looked at them. From that day forward, I understood. And again, here's the value of that special place that I get to spend time at teaching myself, making a lot of mistakes, but I'm making mistakes on my own time in my own place uh, that I can return to you know, repetitively. Uh, and my mistakes aren't so uh, graphic or unforgivable because I can repeat them, uh, hopefully with success. And then of course, one of the things that uh, I liked was the more water was really starting to move in and make use of the long exposures for very dramatic uh, compositions and, and really interesting looks. These are all done in the middle of the day with an ND filter. All I'm doing is making sure that it's no harsh sunspots uh, and I'm just prolonging the exposure and I'm playing with all the different um, compositions that I can find and that I can create and I can enjoy uh, image-wise. Um, that are very, very dramatic, very beautiful, uh, very different. This was probably, you know, a huge blossoming time for me in my photography when I started, again, how much power I had over the impact and the result of an image. And it's not so much just the result of an image, but the emotional impact it could have for myself, most importantly, but maybe for other people, that I could make them feel like they could hear the waterfall, that they were standing there next to me, um, and when I shared them with people, you know, it was, it was wonderful to get conversation out of that. You know, I belonged to a camera club for a long time and um, the Merrimack Valley Camera Club out of North Andover, just uh, it was such an important part of my life to, to not just have a place to go and talk about f-stops and shutter speeds with people that were also interested in it, but to share my images uh, via competitions or presentations or whatever and get feedback and realize what was good, what needed to be better, and what was already better. Uh, and most importantly that came from that camera club was getting the respect of some of the peers, um, the Dick Mortons, the Bob Rings, um, for these people to say, you know, that's really nice, you're doing a good job. Um, 
there was no reward or reward that could ever match that. Um, so for me, it was a wonderful time of blossoming. So that means we have to we have to listen to some water. Time for some more beer. So something like that, believe it or not, became the inspiration for a lot of the photos that I did when it came to water, that sound. I can hear it moving. So when I close my eyes, and this is where that my saying, when I when I sign off on stuff, my, my mantra when I'm teaching, my own personal mantra in photography is photograph what you feel. And I mean that very literally, is how do I feel about this? How do I feel about what I'm seeing? How do I feel about what I'm hearing? How do I feel about where I fit into that? And I try to capture that very, very specifically. And at a waterfall, when I close my eyes and I listen and I hear that moving, that moving water and that running water, that's what I want to capture. I want to capture that sense of action, of life moving. So as I made my way past the big waterfall and started exploring more of the areas in Bingham and up into uh, some of the more real, real, you know, rustic rural back uh, logging roads, I would find these incredible uh, small waterfalls and streams. This one is called Stony Brook. Um, it's just a beautiful place for photography year round. Um, it's full of all these little series of waterfalls and pools. Uh, wonderful vignettes of the seasons can be had here. Um, when you're here, you feel like you're completely removed from all other places. You feel like you're literally in the middle of nowhere and no one's ever been there before. Uh, but again, you start to learn. This is the documentary photo. This is where you start to learn more about, I'm taking a picture of Stony Brook and I'm doing it with a long uh, shutter speed and it's sometime in the fall because the leaves are colored. And the teaching method for yourself is like, okay, there's, there's got to be more to this. I didn't drive, you know, 27 miles out in the middle of nowhere to take one standard documentary photo. I have to stay here and push myself to create and to look for different things and different patterns and appreciate all the different, you know, bigger aspects and smaller aspects of what nature was doing, what nature was providing to me. Um, finding different ways to say the same thing. This is this photo right here. And then just by moving my feet, I didn't change the lens. All I did was move my feet and I lowered everything and I changed the perspective to include more leaves in the foreground uh, that go along with the season. So this is a great potential for developing your storytelling skills. Um, it's, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's fun, it's very enlightening. And then you start to just digest things again and dissect them up into interesting little pieces. Uh, a fallen cedar log in black and white because in color it's so saturated with, with yellows and oranges that are falling apart that it, it, it becomes too much of the, uh, the focal point when I want it to be really just a part of the scene. The story of you know, nature, you know, uh, this, the water hammering its log to, to uh, break it down. Changing your depth of field to isolate something. Uh, again, just working on your skills as a storyteller, trying to do the best job you can to go home with the best images uh, possible in your photo essay. Creative ways. You know, the water's moving. I'm creating a, a, this a long shutter speed using an ND filter. Um, just a handful of leaves thrown into the to the uh, to the little pool, and you realize if you watch long enough, the current just swirls them and swirls them. Well, all that gets recorded in a long 30-second exposure. Um, some of the results are terrible, um, but you know, I always tell people, you know, photography is a lot like golf. It can go bad all day long. It just takes one great photo, one great shot, to make you come back the next day. And they're just wonderful little vignettes, little small scenes. Just keep exploring. You're never done. You can't pull up to any particular place, get out of your car, set your tripod up, go through all that, and take a photo and think for one second that you're done, because you're not. It's going to look different the next day. It's going to look different with a different lens. It's going to look different with a different filter. It's going to look different in overcast light compared to sunlight. It's a never-ending repetitive process. And the smartest and best thing you can ever do for yourself is to return 
to the same places over and over and over again and teach yourself more about the results you get uh, from what happens in those places so that you can apply them to bigger moments in your life. Again, just changing a perspective. I love the, the, the canyons, just crazy. It's just beautiful. And then there's the seasons. You know, we, we make the mistake of, you know, I disagree with some people in photography, and uh, for that I apologize, but there's something to photograph 24 hours a day. You just have to match your subject with whatever the conditions are. Um, anybody that says, oh, you can only photograph from 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning for the sweet light, and you take the rest of the afternoon and you go back out from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, I'm like, that's great if that works for you, but that doesn't work for me. I want to find something to photograph at 11. I want to find a, something to photograph at 9 o'clock at night because there are subjects and there are conditions that allow it to happen. And that particular happens in the different seasons. You can't just say it's New England, so Maine is only good in the fall. You know, as beautiful it is and the foliage, New England is, is, is spectacular. But it's also spectacular in the spring and the winter and the summer. So you have to get up and enjoy all the different seasons. And we're going to enjoy one of my favorites right now. Beer break. Spring peepers. One of my favorite, favorite sounds in the in anywhere, but particularly in the north woods at the cabin, the, the stream out back that has been dammed up. That's right from the window uh, at the kitchen uh, with my cell phone. And then you got streams that pop up in the spring everywhere. There's running water everywhere from all the melting snow and the and the, the ice runoff, and of course any spring uh, rain you have. Uh, this little tiny stream is not, I mean, it's, you know, a frog could jump across the stream in, in the summertime because it's so narrow and small, but in the spring, uh, over on one of the hills, it turns into this raging little brook. And then in the woods, again, lady slippers, uh, you know, uh, ferns that are just starting to unfurl and grow. Other little tiny, tiny, tiny specimens of life that are beautiful and delicate. And, and all three, what they require more than anything is, again, got to get down low to their eye level. So you got to get dirty. You got to get a little bit mucky. You got to get a little uncomfortable. You have to be incredibly patient outside. There's going to be wind. There's going to be insects. Uh, there's going to be things that make you itch and sweat and scratch. And all of those are great excuses to pack your stuff up and go back inside the camp or your car or wherever you're at. But I promise you, if you stick it out, you'll be rewarded. And uh, I love to go looking for these little scenes. Uh, these are probably now my favorite subjects in the woods, far more than the wild animals. Summertime, you know, the goldenrod comes out. It's it's a weed, but it can be very beautiful, particularly on a foggy morning at the edge of a pond. Tree growth, um, you know, the under the under you know, undergrowth, all the small the ferns and the blueberry bushes and the junipers and things like that. This is intentional camera movement painting. This is some of the things I like to do to remind myself that I'm the person in charge. I'm the creative being, not my camera, not my laptop, not my software editing package. It's me. It's how I look at things and how I feel about them and how I go about capturing and depicting them. And I have to remind myself all the time that I am the creative uh, power. So I like to do these little painting things because it ends up, if you do it correctly, which is you know about a 15th of a second, really fast on the movement. Um, the real fast on the movement is what records the detail, even though it's a slow shutter speed, uh, they can look like paintings. And of course, the fall. The fall is just magnificent. I mean, it's just beautiful. If you get peak foliage in and around Seoul and Maine, it is breathtaking. Um, absolutely breathtaking. We have, we're really fortunate that the, uh, the second workshop we ever did there for fall foliage was peak foliage. And it was just, it was unbelievable. I mean, the colors were outrageous. And again, starting to learn and remember, there's always a different way to look at things. Same day, same lens, same road. All I did was go from standing up at eye level on my tripod to lowering my tripod using the flip screen so I can look at the screen without having to lay on the ground. Um, nice valuable part of the flip screen on my Nikon Z7 and just shoot from a different perspective, isolating one part of fall foliage instead of the grandeur of the big scene. Wintertime. Wintertime is beautiful. I mean, it's uncomfortable, it's cold, it's windy, it's harsh, 
um, but it's beautiful. And uh, as you drive some of the roads up there, um, you can be rewarded with some amazingly beautiful, beautiful winter scenes. Some big, some small, just an apple tree on one of the back roads. Uh, it's just a simple scene, but quite striking, quite beautiful. If I remember, and then we're going to finish that over at the pond. Over the pond. I even threw a couple of black flies in there for if you guys could see them. But my journeying around, my exploring around, ended up uh, bringing me to this beautiful pond called Emden Pond uh, in the town of Emden, which is about oh, 12 miles away from the camp. And uh, it's one of my favorite places. Um, I used to go here just to go swimming. Um, and then I realized what a wonderful place it was to go just sit here at the boat launch and, and see sunset, um, have a beer, relax. Um, and then, of course, my photography brought me to the pond. Uh, but like in most places, ponds have a lot of limited access, meaning like if there's any properties around, you can't just go walking through people's property. So I would always go here and I'd try to do my best from the edge of the pond. And as I learned more about the natural world, I realized all the different scenes and the different wildlife that went in conjunction with ponds. So I started to spend time making sure that I drove around and I explored more spots. I would go back up on the logging roads or I knew I had passed a pond or a stream in the past. Again, so busy looking for moose or deer or bear, I started to remember these spots that were gonna be beautiful for other types of photography and I started to return. And I started to explore and look around and, and, and appreciate the, the different scenes for what they were. But again, I was always restricted to the shoreline. I was always restricted about how far out I could reach. I could only go as far as my longest lens, which you know, it took a long time before I got past a 400 millimeter lens. So I would do the best I could for wildlife uh, along the edges of the ponds. And, you know, there would be ducks that would be abundant and fun to photograph. But again, you know, I'll be honest and say, you know, I wanted something more dramatic. Uh, so you're always on the lookout. So sometimes it'd be something as beautiful as a great blue heron just sitting stoically and patiently and fishing on the edge of a pond. And you get really, really lucky if a loon happened to be close enough to the edge of the pond. And this was really a huge thing for me. You know, uh, this is one of my mother's favorite animals. So I wanted to photograph loons because it was my mom's favorite thing. And, um, you know, I got fortunate a couple of times from the edge of the Emden Pond uh, that, you know, I'd sit still enough and they might swim into the cove and maybe just maybe you'd catch a little behavior like this. Um, or perhaps. Uh, right there at Emden at the boat launch, there was an osprey nest on one of the trees for a good long while and they would come and go. Um, and they were amazing to see up in the sky and photograph. And then again, back to that really big popular thing that everybody likes to see in Maine is moose. Uh, and they're wonderful to see anywhere, uh, but this is in their environment. They like wetlands and marshlands. Uh, it's where a lot of their food is. Uh, so it's quite you know, exciting to see them on the edge of a pond. It used to be really common. We used to see, um, you know, a lot of moose in and around Stalin. I have not seen a moose in and around Stalin now for probably three or four years. Um, I think they're under a lot of pressure from hunting still. And I think the winter ticks, the deer ticks, are taking a horrific toll uh, and killing off a lot of the moose. And uh, I think it's going to become a big problem in the future, but that's my own opinion. So, then I figured, I got to figure out how to not stand on the edge uh, of the pond. I needed to be So I purchased a kayak. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of people have great success. Uh, you know, I'd see images on Facebook or in camera club competitions or whatever it might be. Uh, and I figured, you know, I'm gonna get myself a kayak and, and go do some photography from the water, which now is gonna give me a different perspective and access to things in a way that I've never had before. Uh, very important to note that uh, Shipyard Beer is an excellent kayak companion. 
but I start to put the kayak in my my you know Toyota or my pickup truck ahead of the time or whatever and just haul it all around to the different little ponds and lakes up around the cabin uh, and I would just set off and I would go on these little paddling adventures that were just that adventures I love them and, and even if I didn't see wildlife it was incredible um, I always saw wildlife but if I didn't get to photograph wildlife but the experience of being on the water on something that's not motorized, you're right down, you're only you know a couple feet off the water. Um, it's an incredibly peaceful, remote feeling that is worthwhile, even if you don't have a camera with you. But I always had a camera. And that started to change my opportunities when it came to creatively capturing some of these animals that I think are some of the most beautiful animals in the world. And that's the common loon. Uh, their summer plumage, when they live on the lakes, they in the winter time they actually live on the ocean. They completely change to a kind of mottled gray with the white specks. But when they're in summer plumage and they're they're on the water, uh, they're just one of the most spectacular uh, specimens I've ever seen. And to be able to be literally at eye level, uh, frame filling. This is not cropped. This is filling the frame. Um, it's just some of my favorite photos I've ever taken. And I carry an extra bit of pride with these because what I learned by photographing a kayak is it's incredibly difficult. So if you can imagine you're inside a bobbing cork and you're trying to take pictures of really small other bobbing corks, there's nothing about it that's easy. Um, so trying to stay steady, trying to maintain any type of composition or sharpness is really challenging. So when you get good photos, from a kayak like this, you should be really proud of yourself because they're not easy. Um, again, starting to learn some of the behavior when it comes to a loon, I want you to look at the posture of this loon. Where is his body? His body is pretty much up in the, in the water, correct? This one's a little bit lower. Do you know why? Because this one's a little bit more alarmed at my presence. A loon will get lower in the water to, to camouflage themselves more. So if they're sitting upright in the water, uh, pretty much like a like a duck, if you will. Um, they're very comfortable. They're not feeling threatened or alarmed or anything of the sort. So you know that your presence is completely accepted. Once they start to shrink, where the water goes over the back of their feathers, you're too close. And that's when you have to be responsible to back off and give them space. That's their environment, not yours. And then a couple of years ago up on uh, Emden Pond, I, I made my mind up that particular summer. I don't know what was so different about that summer. Was it, I, I was not happy just getting pictures of a loon. Um, I still don't have enough good pictures of loon or good loon pictures, but uh, I decided that particular summer that I was going to capture a photo of a loon calling because that is what makes a loon unique to me is that beautiful call that we all have heard um, that is just incredible. So I would set out in a kayak over at Emden Pond quite often early in the morning or late in the afternoon. And I would paddle around, I would photograph loons, and it was I did everything I could to capture this one particular moment. And then the one time I got lucky, um, and it is, it's good fortune. It's not all skill. There's skill in setting my camera and doing certain things, but everything that happens with light and where the animals go, that's just good fortune. Um, this one was heavily backlit, and, uh, and then I ended up really loving it because of all the bokeh, all the sparkly in the background. Um, so this is a perfect example. I might put this image into a camera club competition that I used to belong to. And any number of judges would say, oh, you know, it's backlit, it's too bright, the sparkles in the background are distracting, we can't see enough of its face or its eye, any number of reasons to mark it down because that's what they have to do. They have to be subjective. But for me, this is my most successful moon photo ever because it captures literally how I feel about them. They are beautiful and elegant and, and, and so soulful in their sound and they live in this twinkly environment full of interest and light. So for me personally, and that's what matters more, the judge stuff or the, uh, some art gallery or whatever, some critique, those are all guidelines for you to maybe think about getting better at things. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. It's all about you. It's how you feel about it. And then of course, the ultimate thing in a, in a kayak is to capture a moose, a bull moose, uh, in his natural environment. And this is something up in Maine on one of the back ponds um, that uh, this guy was underwater and uh, I could see the bubbles and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I paddled close to him and he popped his head up. And I will tell you that uh, he was probably just as bit, every bit as startled to see me as I was him. 
Um, and I didn't stick around for too long because uh, there was no particular reason for him to be annoyed with me. Uh, it was summertime. It wasn't mating season or anything like that. But, you know, there's no real need to be, you know, near a thousand pound animal uh, when I'm defenseless in a kayak. And that brings us back, you know, toward uh, Emden Pond. It's just the, these environments just to stay in and photograph in repetitively, going back, long exposures, different lenses, experimenting with trying to capture how I feel about this place. Um, I will always go here. Uh, at whatever level my photography reaches, uh, I will always go here. It, it, I've been here probably more of the times than I've been to Noble Light, which is saying a lot. Um, I photograph the same thing repetitively and I still learn things. And it was because of all my curiosity about these other things, all my curiosity and the information and the knowledge that I was gaining it just gave me confidence to go explore and look for more things. And this is where my photography started to round out uh, to what it is today that, you know, uh, if I ever had to coin a phrase for myself, uh, it's the best get out of jail free card when it comes to any type of label. And that's I'm a travel photographer, which means I shoot everything. Um, and I love to explore all the back roads up around the cabinets. Some of my greatest memories are, you know, leaving at six o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee and a couple of peanut butter sandwiches and coming back at nine o'clock at night. On some of those rides, my mother was with me where we would just laugh and have fun. My mother's sense of adventure was great. And uh, it was always exciting to just go start roaming around and start noticing that Solon, Maine was so much more than birds in my woods or deer in my woods or ducks on a pond or loons or moose or whatever. Uh, it was made up of so many different things, and all I had to do is just keep changing the way that I thought about them, keep changing the way I looked at them, and changing the way that I tried to record them about how I felt. So I started to notice more about, you know, just uh, the environment, about uh, the local uh, people, the local farms, the history of the local things. It's an old abandoned farm. And you sit there and you look at it and you can't help but wonder, like, where do these people go? What happened to the family? Why does nobody want this property? Somebody still comes and cuts the lawn, so somebody owns it, but the house and the farm are completely abandoned and it's just magnificent. And I can only imagine what it looked like you know, 75 years ago. Um, I, I think it's an important thing to have a very romantic imagination when you're a photographer because it helps you visualize things. It helps inspire creativity when you look at things, when you can think about them with great depth, with great care, uh, a great deal of concern at times, um, and a great deal of compassion and respect. And you start looking at little tiny things like little shacks and an apple tree. Every time I go to Solon, I drive right through Skowhegan. I'm usually in such a rush to get to my cabin. The only thing I ever stop in Skowhegan for is the grocery store and gas. Uh, and that's usually coming and going. Usually I'm in such a hurry to get to my cabin, I drive right through it. And when it's time to go home, I've, I've dragged it out so long that it's time to get going. There's no stopping for anything. So uh, one of the trips we did for, for hunts a couple of years ago, um, we stopped and we went down to Skowhegan one night. And I said, let's go down. It's an old mill town. There's a lot of wonderful, interesting things with the Kennebec River and the dam and everything like that. Start noticing all the little nuances that make places unique, the history. Uh, it's, you know, um, Solon's been in existence for, you know, uh, since the mid 1700s, late 1700s, after the Revolutionary War. You know, Maine used to be Massachusetts. In the Revolutionary War, the United States government had no money. So what they did to all the soldiers was like, hey, we can't pay you for the past three years of service to the country, but we're going to give you 400 acres of land in northern Massachusetts, which was Maine. So the first settlers, the first inhabitants of, of white settlers of, of Solon, were a lot of Revolutionary War era soldiers who were just capitalizing on the land grants that were given to them by the government because they didn't have any money. And you start to realize that there's layers and layers to these histories and they're not big, they're not pronounced, um, they're not glamorous and glorious, but they're there and they're part of the fabric that makes up the story of the town. And then that brings us down to this beautiful, beautiful building called the South Solon Meeting House. This is literally about a mile and a half from the camp. And it's an old meeting house um, built in the uh, early 1840s, I believe it was. Um, it was built to be exactly what it is. It's, it's a meeting house that was used for uh, social gatherings, uh, municipal gatherings, weddings, church services, you name it. This was 
the typical New England building, this is what they call papal design. You see the papal shapes over the, the window and the doors. It's a very small, plain white building on the corner uh, of the South Solon Road, uh, not far from my, from my cabin. And when I first started going to the cabin, um, I would drive by this place a lot without really giving it a second look. Because again, it was not on my radar of the type of photographer I was. I was too wrapped up looking in the field across the street from it for deer. Um, and then, you know, uh, finally, you know, curiosity got the best of me and we stopped and we looked at it. And, and over time, I would go back and look at it. And sadly, a few years ago, some vandals did some pretty bad damage to it. And it was when I found out about the damage that the vandals had done that I went to see what they had done. Um, because uh, there's a very prestigious art school in Skowhegan, Maine. And in the 1920s, all the art students came up to this meeting house and they painted the entire inside of the meeting house with these beautiful frescoes that go from floor to ceiling. Uh, they're all biblical scenes, colorful, um, absolutely beautiful. And sadly, some vandals went in and did some damage. They broke some windows and things like that. So once I found out the damage they did, and I started to go look at it, I started to realize what a beautiful building it was. I started to realize what incredible history it had here. Um, and then as I began to learn more about photography and even began to teach photography, I realized that sometimes when we coach photography, we teach photography, we go to these great big places, you know, the Grand Tetons, Acadia National Park, the Great Smoky Mountains. These are huge places that are all encompassing and sometimes you learn the most by being confined, by being restricted into a small area. So I started taking, uh, when I was New England photo workshops, we took some people here. And of course, once we became uh, Hunt's photo uh, for the photo adventures, I brought people here. And when you go inside, it's magnificent. And the whole building is really probably the same size as my cabin. It's about 24 feet long by 20 feet wide. It's got a second story. Uh, and as you can clearly see, it is covered in these beautiful, colorful frescoes. Um, the pews are old, wooden. Uh, they smell like old wood. They're rough. They're not comfortable to sit in. Um, it's very plain and yet incredibly beautiful. And if you can go into this building and make yourself do 20 different images and come away with 20 different images, you're doing really, really well. Because this is really difficult to work in such a small environment, but it starts to teach you about how to look at things differently, look at the detail, look at light, look at shadow, look at structure, look at composition. And you start to move yourself around at eye level, trying to capture a little bit of the time of year out through the window and just using all natural light. Different aspects of capturing, you know, making sure that the door is closed so there's not this great big white blob of light, you know, the little kind of things you can do to help yourself out. But not documenting not only the frescoes, but the, the history. This is a mural in the front. When you rate right come in, there's the two front doors uh, to my right. Um, and these, this painting on the wall is the founders of Solon, now with some of the more historic people that have lived there over the years, right up to the caretakers of today. Uh, it's a beautiful mural, but it's a very tough place to shoot because it's so small. Again, finding different ways to say fall foliage. You know, we can all go take a picture of a mountainside covered in beautiful colored leaves or a stream surrounded by colored leaves or colored leaves in moving water. But how else can you tell the story of fall in New England? Well, New England to me, there's every town, every community has one of these little tiny, you know, church-like buildings. You know, if it's, if it's a vintage town with a lot of history, there's one of these buildings in it. And they all get windows out into the open showing what time of season is. So you have to think, this is where you start learning about, you know, storytelling. How dramatic can I be in my storytelling? How subtle can I be? How, how powerful can I be? Um, and again, that power resides with you and how you capture what you see. Beautiful little details, different angles, different shapes. Great depth of field, narrow depth of field. Just a very challenging thing. Getting down, shooting right at the level of the pews for some different details keeping it simple, getting rid of all the color, just leaving it to black, hymnals or black and white. Putting my camera literally on the ground. I have an L bracket on my camera, so I can literally set it right on the ground and just shoot a stack of old dusty hymnals underneath one of the 
underneath one of the pews. And this is part of that whole process of, you know, looking beyond the obvious and finding all the little pieces to fit into the puzzle, to tell a bigger story. Getting up into the second loft with my 7200 and shooting down, shooting, you know, pieces uh, of the meeting house in different angles. Having fun with a fisheye lens on my old Fuji camera. Uh, one of, it turned out to be one of my funnest lenses uh, that I ever owned um, was just being able to play with a, with a fisheye lens and in the right atmosphere, in the right uh, uh, composition, a tremendous amount of uh, fun and very, very poignant photos. And then you get to the kind of the core of, you know, before it was ever, a, you know, an outdoor destination for fishing and hunting. It was a very, uh, it was part of the, the timber industry, which was really huge. Uh, and before that, it was a farming community. So then you start to stretch your boundaries and your creativity and look outside the obvious and um, head down to Skowhegan where the, every, every Saturday in season, they have these spectacular farmer's markets. All of you, if you want to challenge yourself and do something different that's colorful, full of small detail, full of interesting people waiting to perhaps have their portrait taken, uh, an added value to the story, the photo essay of where you live or where you are or where you're going, go find a farmer's market. It's amazing. The people are a, a wide array of walks of life. Um, the textures of the people uh, are fantastic. Um, just wonderful storytelling images. And then of course, all the crazy wonderful colors that come out of the earth. Um, radishes and onions just fantastic wonderful things to look for to photograph and you have to imagine and i say this all the time and all the photo walks and photo adventures and every one of these presentations i've done so far and i will do it in every class forever we're all in pursuit of that one definitive photograph that defines us steve mcmurray took a picture of the afghan girl that's his defining photo that identifies from the gentleman that took the photograph of the firefighters raising the American flag after 9-11 or the raising the American flag on Iwo Jima. These are all life and career defining photos uh, of one individual. And we are all in pursuit of that. And, and I hope we all achieve that. There, there's one photo that becomes synonymous with who we are. But the reality is everywhere we go, we're gonna be putting together a grouping of photos to tell a, a photo essay of where we were. And somewhere in there will be photos that are stronger than others but build yourself a photo essay wherever you go. You don't wanna drive around Solon, Maine for a week and, and just wait for the fall foliage to look just right for one maple tree. You wanna explore everything. Uh, so that's why I love the added value to your, your compositions, to your eye, and just to your humanity to find different things to go explore. They're wonderful. You know, uh, it turns out, you know, this woman, um, uh, you know, again, so I say it and all this stuff, don't be afraid to have a conversation. This woman that uh, has all these beautiful hand knit things and this beautiful pottery, her husband uh, was a pipe fitter, a uh, big, rugged, burly man with, with giant, strong hands, lost his eyesight. And now he does pottery. He makes pottery. And it's an amazing transition in his life. And the pottery he makes is absolutely beautiful. My coffee mug that I use every morning came from there. So again, you know, uh, huge value to your photography is meeting people, having conversations, not being afraid to have a conversation, not being afraid to tell people what you're doing. Hey, I'm a photographer. I'm here to take some photos. It's okay. You should be proud of that. And, and the more that you present yourself in a warm, open, honest way, they're going to receive you like that, making it easier for you to do your job. And then, of course, this leads us into, you know, other parts of the farming community. Uh, and we go up to, uh, you know, for years now, ever since we first went to the cabin, we used to go to this place called North Star Orchards, and we can now call the Dimmick family who owns the orchard, some of our good friends. They're absolutely stunningly wonderful, hardworking, beautiful people. Um, uh, Mr. Dimmick passed away, sadly, uh, over a year ago, and uh, just the mom and the daughter, Jen, who's wonderful, and the, and the son, Rob, who's just so hardworking. And they're just some of the most humble, smart, wonderful, nice people. And for years, my family's been going there and, and would become friends with them. And when it came time to teach a workshop, I'd like to think that the foundations of friendship and respect that we've built, let me say to Jen, hey, can I, can I bring a class up here and let them walk around your orchard and do photography? And her answer was, absolutely, you can do that. Just please follow the rules like you've always done. 
Uh, this is our family farm. This is our crop that we use to, to feed ourselves and pay our mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. And I was really proud that you know the, I could take a class up there and people really accepted it and walked around. We got to explore this beautiful, beautiful farm and the orchard and all the little wonderful details uh, that make it up. Um, it's just a spectacular part uh, of Solon for me now. Uh, the, the farm's actually in the next town over in Madison, but for me, it's Solon. It's part of uh, it's part of my other home there, uh, and it's full of amazing, wonderful, beautiful textures and colors and detail. Um, I remember the when I took this photo here. Um, this photo was, you know, is it my greatest photo? No, no, it's not. Um, but this was at a time when a very good friend of mine, Bob Ring, um, who has since passed away, wasn't doing so well. And Bob loved clouds. And I remember walking up this road and I had this very you know, emotional moment where I realized, I don't know if I was ever gonna get to do photography with Bob ever again. And the sky was full of these amazing clouds. And I remember smiling and laughing to myself how much he would say, this scene, this is the nuts. And then he'd be complaining that his lens wasn't wide enough to capture all. So photos don't have to be magnificent works of art. They have great meaning. This, this is a very significant photo for me. Um, and uh, that's a true story for a lot of our photos. They don't have to be award-winning or whatever, competition-winning to be good. They just have to have meaning. And as you roam around the orchard, you know, what farm doesn't have a green John Deere tractor? You have to take photos of that. But then the colors of the season, we were there in October, so Jen always puts out these amazing displays of pumpkins and gourds and things like that. And then inside her beautiful shop, you can go in. As, if you can't find, uh, there's, there's nothing in the shop that's not related to apples. Um, she's got a little bit of everything. All the jams and the, the jellies are all handmade by her and her mother. Um, it's a huge mass of obviously labor and love, but it's, it's that much better and that much sweeter because it's all done right there by hand. Fun stuff. And this is part of your storytelling, just, you know, getting into things, finding small details to incorporate into your photos that they have more meaning. And the view from the top of a hill is just ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Overlooking the Western mountains of Maine, beautiful place for sunset, just spectacular. Their new sugar house where they make uh, maple syrup. And that was the reason why, going back to what I said at the very beginning, you know, the very first photo adventure that we did as Hunt's Photo Adventures was right here in Solon, Maine. And, and again, my belief was if we can make this work in Solon, Maine, we can make it work anywhere. And, and we're doing just exactly that. Things are going really well. We're, we're traveling the world. We're going as far as Italy and Cuba and Tanzania, um, across our country, but we're also still doing uh, local things in Maine and New England and Vermont and, and all that wonderful good stuff. Um, but this was really the beginning, the epicenter, and it, and it was really special for me because up until this point, I had never really shared the cabin with anybody. Um, I think anything that's special to you, the greatest fear you have is that somebody won't appreciate it the way you appreciate it. And I know my cabin's not for everybody. I know that everybody's not going to go there and be happy with you know, the fact that there's black flies in June and, um, you know, it could be a little chilly in, in May when you don't want it to be chilly or whatever. There's a whole bunch of things you can say about discomfort. Um, but it takes a special person to, to feel it the way I feel it. And I know that. And, and I, I, I'm not jaded about other people, but I was leery about sharing with people this. What if they don't like it? What if they come all the way up here and they don't like it? Well, so I took a big risk by bringing people here for the first ever photo adventure. And I was really happy to do so. I was really proud uh, to lead the first photo adventure, but to lead it in my special place. Um, so we made our way around. Here was our first big group. Uh, Ron Phillips, uh, who does a lot of the photo walks, was my uh, photo assistant for this. Paul Nelson, who's the director of education. This is the only photo adventure he was ever on. Uh, Mr. Bob Watts, who's recently retired after 37 years with Nikon, he there, he was there to represent Nikon uh, with not only equipment and his knowledge, but just his incredible, incredible enthusiasm and good nature. And we took this group of, of people and we had a phenomenal experience. Um, we all stayed or they all stayed down at the, a local campground in some very rustic cabins. 
Um, and we had dinner in the lodge every night. Um, uh, you know, the family that runs it, you know, the, 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 one of the, the best quote that came out of the whole weekend was somebody, I can't remember who said it, but they said, I feel like I'm eating dinner at my aunt's house every night because we had things like spaghetti and meatloaf and meat and uh, meatloaf. And it was just amazing. Um, and the, the cabins are rustic. Uh, there's no disguising that, but they're rustic in the most wonderful, relaxing way. And everybody took to it uh, wonderfully. And right there, this is right from the edge of one of the cabins. You're right on the edge of the Kennebec River. Uh, cold morning in October, the steam's rising off the river. You got some sunlight coming through. Uh, driving around, we found this. Anybody that, here's, here's a little quiz for everybody. When do lupin bloom? Lupin bloom every June. Uh, it's a spring flower. This was in October. We were driving by one of my favorite fields that I point out to people. That field is usually covered in lupin in June. Lo and behold, there was three or four lupin in full, magnificent, perfect bloom in October. So it was very easy to jump out of the car and go photograph these things. However, the field is posted. It says no trespassing without permission. And all the people that own the field, they're actually from upstate New York. They weren't anywhere near to ask the question. So I went across the street, I had knocked on the door, introduced myself to the gentleman there and I explained what we were doing. And he's the proprietor, he takes care of the land when the owners aren't there. And he did say, you know, it's not my property to say you can or can't go on there. And, and again, so I just kind of threw myself at his mercy if he wants it. We're, we're just gonna stand at the edge of the field and take photos. And thankfully, he nicely agreed. And we all spent a good chunk of time over there photographing this really unique experience. And the lesson there is, be a nice photographer, ask permission, introduce yourself, be polite, be respectful. It is gonna get you much, much further in photography and in life than if we all just walked out into the field assuming we had the right to do so because we were just taking a photo. Um, we did the right thing and we did it in the right way. And I'm determined that in all photo adventures will be done in that same fashion. We're never gonna take for granted the assumption that we can just do whatever we want. That is false and it is not nice. Uh, so, lesson there, be a nice photographer. We had magnificent foliage that was just crazy beautiful. It was wonderful. Uh, we even got my, our friend Chet. Now, Chet used to work for Olympus, now works for a fishing tackle, fishing company. Uh, he is a fly fisherman out of New Hampshire, and he agreed to come up and be our model. We had him stand in the, in the Kennebec River and, and fly fish, and our job was to photograph him uh, with the backdrop uh, of some foliage and whatever vantage points we could get. And it was great fun and added a huge dimension to the workshop. It was one of those things I took a gamble on. I'm like, are people gonna wanna do this for a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour? We did this for almost two hours. And when Chad finally said, okay, my arm's getting tired and the water's getting cold, uh, everybody was disappointed because it was it, we were making great photos and it was pretty fun and very challenging. One of the nights we went over to Emden Ponds, and we, we just had this wonderful blue hour experience with these long exposures, it was so quiet and calm. At that time of year, the loons were already gone, so there was beautiful, no, no beautiful loons calling at night, but it was just a beautiful, tranquil moment, Spe spectacular. And again, top of the orchard, great sunset, great views. And then the springtime, we came back for another one. These are bunch berries, these grow abundantly in the backwoods, so we had a spring workshop and we roamed around all sorts of wonderful little details in the yard at the cabin or in the woods. Beautiful trillium everywhere, red and white and pink, beautiful. Again, some of the fine, wonderful details. This is where I learned at Emden Pond. I'd always gone to the edge and photographed those rocks. Well, I put my wider angle lens and I got the, the little bit of falls with a long, long exposure. You can tell by the movement in the clouds. So even after you know hundreds of trips over there, this was the first time I'd ever shot this scene, this perspective. And I learned that from somebody else in the workshop. They had uh, uh, a much wider lens than I had on, and they went back and took this shot, and I said, oh my God, I've, I've never looked at it like that. I always try to get the clean view of the water, so to speak. So again, anybody that thinks that they know everything is kidding themselves. There's always something to learn. And of course, at the end of the day, there's just nothing better, uh, whether it's a hard day of work at the woods, a hard day of work in the yard, hard day of photography, or even just the most wonderful day relaxing, enjoying nighttime uh, at the cabin. It's just beautiful and wonderful. 
it's so nice to sit in the warmth and the comfort and relax. Finish the day with a fire. I don't think there's anything, any such thing as a bad fire. So that's it. That is my uh, trip uh, to Solon, Maine with all you guys. Uh, it's a very special place for me. Obviously, it's my favorite place in the world. Um, I want to thank all of you for spending your Saturday night traveling with myself and with Hunt's photo. Um, uh, it means a lot to me that so many of you responded and wanted to uh, participate. Um, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So anybody, oh, I think I shut my uh, webcam off there. Sorry about that. Anybody have any questions or thoughts that I can try to answer? We started at about, oh, it looks like we got going at about 7.10. So let's see. <laughs> Bob Watt says he loves that the globe behind me is lit up. That's right. That's my little antique desk globe. I love that. Let me see, Maureen Morse, my webcam is still on. That's right, I probably shut it off, but uh, I dipped it down. Muriel says, what a great shot. I'm not sure what that was, but thank you. No audio on was choppy stuttering. I don't know, Bob, it sounded pretty good on this end. Ah, oh, you couldn't hear the sounds of the videos there, Lisa? Oh, that stinks, it played loud. Maybe it just wasn't loud enough on the presentation. Um, Chris Kern says, thank you, Don and Hunts. I agree. Thank you very much, Chris, for appreciating it. That was very cool. Beth DeVore says, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate you attending. That's right, Lisa. You'll have to get up there with one of the workshops, and uh, maybe that's a place where we could do something for the Portsmouth Camera Club for a weekend or something like that. Uh, uh, Susan Olson, thank you very much. Says that was amazing. Uh, great tips. Uh, I hope so. That was kind of, that was my biggest hope that there'd be some good tips in there. Wendy Damon, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Mickey Dillon, all the way from Georgia. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to share my, my beautiful place with us and whatever little tips and philosophy I might have, I hope they're helpful in some way, shape, or form. Carol, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for, you know, spending Saturday night with me. Um, I think that's a pretty worthwhile trip. James, good. Thank you, James, I enjoyed it as well. Shireen Scott, thank you, beautiful photos. Thank you very much for that, I appreciate that. You know, it's a, it's a risky thing sharing your photos with people because again, it's just like sharing your house or a great family recipe or whatever it might be. What if somebody doesn't like it? You know, what if somebody doesn't look at it the same way you do? But uh, you have to take pride in what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. The, uh, you're very welcome, Richard Jordan. You're very welcome for the webinar. I think it's important, you know, we're certainly doing these. Some of these are, you know, for $20 a piece. They're more instructional, if you will. Uh, but I think it's really important for Hunts and myself to make sure we blend in um, some nice, feel good, let's just sit back and take a trip somewhere. So I'm gonna do some, some of these other ones are gonna be on trips to Tanzania, trips to Cuba, um, the Grand Tetons, other places in Maine, Provincetown, whatever it might be. We're gonna, we're gonna do some other one of these. and. I've been saying to everybody, even if tomorrow um, life goes back to normal or as normal as it can be for all of us, uh, Hunts is gonna continue these webinars. Uh, they're a fantastic resource uh, for us to reach people and for people that, you know, somebody, Matt Dillon from, or Mickey Dill, D Dillon from, uh, from Georgia, she, they can't come up here for a photo walk, but we can do a webinar with them, so that's really cool. Maureen Demsey. It's great, thanks. You are, thank you, Maureen, for, for visiting. That is really cool. I love that. I reached out and invited some family members today, the Demsies, who are all just really wonderful people. So I hope a bunch of them made it in. I, I don't know how we did for attendance, but uh, yeah, I'm really bummed, Mickey, that the sounds didn't come through with the, uh, with the videos. I gotta figure that out. Nancy Wright says, thanks for the adventure. I had to get there in person. Me too, actually, I gotta go up tomorrow. I have to cut some trees down that fell on the power lines and ripped the electrical service off the cabin and no one will repair the electrical service until I remove the trees. So I had to go up there and do some chainsaw. Um, the, the name of the pond is Emden, E-M-B-D-E-N. 
Emden Pond in the town of Emden, Maine, which is one town over from Solon. Muriel says, great pictures. This place wonderful. I, I, think it, I think it looks wonderful. I love it. I mean, I'm very biased, but I love it. Carolyn Livingston said, yeah, that is, got to figure out the sound. I'm so sorry about that, guys. They play perfectly fine when I play them in the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm not sure why. Maybe just the microphone or the audio wouldn't pick it up or something. But I will make sure that that is uh, fixed for any and all in the future. Stephanie Sanders says, great as usual. Thank you. Stephanie's up there in Maine. She knows what I'm talking about. Carolyn says she loved this webinar. Me too, Carolyn. I did too. And I got to have a beer. Ryan and Jill Dempsey. That's awesome. They came in too. That's right. I agree right there. I mean, that's that's probably one of the number one things I can ever tell anybody in photography is change your perspective. And Ryan and Jill were just saying that's an important message. And that's true. Right now, we're in the middle of something horrific. And we can all sit around and wring our hands and feel sorry for ourselves and lament this and lament that. And there's enough reason to do that. There's a lot of bad things going on. It's scary. The change of per perspective is we're all home right now with our families as much as we can be. We're as safe as we can be. We have a chance to be constructive in other things. Our relationships are uh, you know, taking care of things at the home, whatever it might be. So it's all a matter of how you look at it. Uh, you have to be respectful and mindful of what's going on, that it's a really bad, tragic, where there's a lot of really incredibly sad things happening right now. Um, but we can't, we can't uh, hide from the rest of life, so to speak. So, um, yeah, change your perspective. And I'm really glad the Demsies were here. That was awesome. Laylith, how are you? How's it going? That's cool. Now, Laylith and I don't know each other. He comments or they comment on my photos in the uh, North American Nature Photography on Facebook. and. Uh, been very nice to add a lot of nice comments, and I'm glad I made it in. That's really cool. Ellen Finkelstein says, thank you. I would like to thank you. Don't need to thank me. You guys showed up. Ina. Ina's been to too many of my workshops and photo walks. She knows all about me. <laughs> no, Harry, nobody was refilling the beer, unfortunately. Kim, Kim Cook left us. Thanks for sharing a special place. Yeah, it's... Uh, it is a very special place. Okay, okay, Nancy Rich says, you convinced me to sign up for the June Solon trip. I just did, so now I hope it runs. Exactly, I hope it does too. I hope it runs because that just means life is back to normal and that's what we need more than anything. We need people to be safe, but we need life to get back to normal uh, as soon as everyone's safe. Eugene, I'd love to have you come to, to, to Solon with me and Hunts and do some exploring with me. Aaron Hurley, thanks so much for the sharing this beautiful place. Yeah, uh, that makes me happy. Joanne Webster, that is my little part of the world. It is a little part, but it's ours. It's my family's, it's mine, it's blood, it's sweat, it's tears. It's, and that's what it's really all about. I, I, don't, I don't need to conquer the world. I just need to be the best I can at my little part of it. David Lee has left us, but he left me with a nice note. David's been on a couple trips with me, and uh, so he, he said the photos left, uh, left him with a lot of inspiration, and that's really pretty sweet, pretty awesome. Ralph has left. Thank you. You're welcome, Ralph. Thank you. JoJo McCourt. Yeah, my favorite place. I, I'm, I, like I said, I used to be really shy about sharing it. I, I didn't take people there, and, and uh, none of my friends have really been there because I know most of them probably wouldn't enjoy it the way I do. But I'm glad that you guys, and, and I think uh, when you take it from the perspective of photography, uh, again, changing your perspective, seeing things differently. Uh, suddenly the old rustic downtown has a different appeal because of photography, instead of just driving through it like, oh, that's all like a little podunk town with nothing in it. Um, so uh, that message carries over. So thank you, Ms. Bova, nice to see you. Thank you for sharing your special place. Very cool. Georgia Green, you're very welcome. She says, fabulous and lovely. Thank you very much, Ms. Yvonne. Great virtual adventure. There you go. The variety. And there you go. And that's a great word to use here. There is, you know, you, we tend to look at things that are ours to the point that they get too common, too familiar. And uh, we stop seeing the variety. And uh, you got to keep working at it. You got to keep working at it because it's all there. We just stop seeing it as much. Oh, Kelly, yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, 
we had almost 300 people signed up and for whatever reason the they got shut off at like 102 so i don't know what happened jeff swinger the swing man jeff swing man's all the way from utah he and i did a workshop together photographing the wild horses of utah last april we should be there right now jeff and it sucks great big giant dog balls that we're not but um we will again, we will again. And Jeff's a really great photographer, Canon photographer, shoots a lot of the Olympics. He works as a, for a wire service and newspapers and he's uh, an amazing sports photographer. Uh, if you get a chance to look him up and he's gonna do a webinar on sports photography for us in the near future and he's gonna do some other workshops with me. So great to see you, Jeff. Poppy, great to see you too. Thank you so much, you're always incredibly kind. Yeah, Mickey, I like that water, you know, I think it goes to what I said about feeling. I, when I see a stream or waterfall, I hear the movement. I want to photograph it as such. The ocean's a little different. Uh, I photograph it a little bit differently because the, the motion and the sound is different. Michael Bielan, trip to Solon with me. There you go. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Michael Bielan's another really good photographer. Jessica, nice to see you again. How do I store my camera in the kayak? Very carefully. Uh, I usually keep it in my lap. I usually keep, uh, uh, when I'm just paddling around, I put it into this wonderful Manfrotto ba uh, uh, bag that's completely waterproof. And when I know I'm gonna use it, I take it out. Uh, I have it uh, with my um, uh, weather protection uh, wrap on it. I keep it in my lap and I even keep a towel over it. Because one thing I found is like when I'm paddling, there's a lot of splashing that goes on. Uh, so I keep it as covered as much as I can. Uh, but if you have the right size kayak for the right size person that you are, uh, based on your height and your weight, it's a very, very stable environment, unless it's really, really windy and choppy. And if it's really windy and choppy, I don't want to go do it anyways, because that means my subject is going to be bouncing all over the place. I'm, I'm always looking for calm days as much as I can. Anastasia, beautiful pictures of your special area. You're very welcome. I'm happy to share, especially with you and your lovely husband, who are so nice. Stephanie Young, a swimming moose. Moose spend a lot of time in the water. They eat 40 pounds of vegetation a day. So uh, that's a lot of salad. They got to get in the water for salad. Helen Stevens left us, but she said, wicked awesome tips. Love that. Wicked. Sandra, love the love bits and pieces photography. ND, yeah, ND filters are a powerful, powerful tool for your camera bag, and they're very simple to use. We just have to accept that they're easier to use. There's no trickery. Your exposure is such, and if you put a ND filter that says it cuts it down by five stops, it reduces your shutter speed by five stops of light. ND filters come in varying degrees. You can buy the, um, uh, the multi ones uh, that have many stops built in. I don't like those. Uh, I like I like a fixed one because there's no light leak. It's and I know it's only a four stop. If you have a wide angle lens and you have a variable ND filter, you might get four stops of blocked light here, but you might get three over here. It's going to look different. I don't like that. So I use fixed ones. Susan McQuarrie, thanks, Don. I got some great tips. Lovely cabin. Well, I'm glad it was the whole idea was a nice trip and uh, some tips along the way. So always got to try to make it a little educated. Well, Sheldon says, thanks, gets one thinking. Yep, good, that's what I want. Bill Brown, you're very welcome. Thanks for attending, Bill. Mickey Dillon says, all that time at Fortune's Rocks. Um, uh, my wife's family has a place at Goose Rocks. So I know that area all too well, that's great. Chip Green, hey bud, how are you? Yeah, thanks for the photo, Bob. Breaks my heart, breaks my heart. Carla, thank you for, no, thank you again, all of you. Thank you, thank you for, for spending your night with us. Paul Sweeney was here. That's great. Paul Sweeney says it leaves him with a lot of inspiration in his photos. Beth, big smile, Keith Bauer. Keith Bauer, you're more than welcome to come anytime you want, my friend. You have an open invitation, whether I'm there or not. You can come use it anytime you want. You just let me know. My buddy Keith is from New Mexico and he's a phenomenal uh, all around photographer, which is what we all should aspire to be. But Keith does wonderful work with uh, long exposures and star trails, night sky photography. And uh, I don't know if he likes to brag about it too much, but he does amazing hummingbird photos. Makes me a little bit on the side of jealous. 
Ellen Weiss has left us, but she says, thanks for continued inspiration. A lens recommendation was right on. Thanks for your help. Good. I'm glad to hear that, Ellen. That's great. She asked me about a lens purchase pretty recently. Muffy has left us. Beth DeBoer. Yeah, the sound keeps cutting out. So it sounds pretty good here. I don't know. Maybe there's something going on. Sally Gaffney, nice to see you. Donna Parker, thank you. She has left. Lori Allen, fabulous. You feel like getting the best shots of all early. No, I, don't, I wouldn't say that the best wildlife shots are early, but it's probably the most prominent time because most wild animals are going to bed down all night and they're going to get up in the morning and be hungry. So they're going to be looking for some food. They can feed during the day. So, you know, late afternoon and twilight might not be as busy. Um, I think morning tends to be a busier time. So therefore it in increases your odds of seeing them or photographing them. Happy birthday to Belle. That's, there you go. Thank you, caller, very much. I appreciate you attending. And Carolyn. That's right, Carolyn. There'll be some more. Susan, uh, Susan was here. Macquarie was here. And we're going to organize some more of the rooftops as soon as we can. Uh, it's a very popular thing. And we can't go to the well too much and make ourselves not welcome there. But we will do more in the future. Yeah. I'll be safe with the chainsaw. That's right, Eugene. It's very important. Be respectful. Be nice. You know, as my mother still says, being nice counts. You know, please and thank you still means an awful lot. And we can never forget that, particularly when we have a camera and we have the responsibility to set a good example for all other photographers, but also also just other people in general. Uh, just because we're taking a photo doesn't give us any more entitlement. If anything, it makes it more difficult uh, and you have to be even more mindful. That's right, Linda Bova with the swing man. Hopefully, Mo, that'll be October. I'm pretty sure that'll be fine, but uh, let's keep uh, keep our fingers crossed. Patience, Oof. Melissa Marsh, patience. It's the number one thing that I have to work on. Too often, I'm too quick to give up, and that's a bad thing. Diane Miller left us, but she said to you, it was a nice presentation. Hope to see you soon. I really, really would love to see everybody soon. Jeff uh, Swing, yeah, Jimmy Pierce, who's uh, uh, Jeff, uh, I don't know if you're still listening. Jeff is out of Utah, but Jimmy Pierce uh, is a uh, sports photographer for Northeast University you know, has, uh, and has his own business doing a tremendous amount of local uh, sports photography for a lot of hockey tournaments and baseball. Uh, Jim himself was a, was a college athlete and uh, has gravitated to photography and uh, left one career to pursue, uh, one good career. Uh, to pursue photography, he's doing really well. And on top of all that, he's such a really nice guy. So uh, Jeff Swinger is just above you somewhere on the list. Jimmy Pierce, you guys should say hello to each other if you can. Jane Peterson, hey Jane, my inner DeWitt. Yeah, greatest compliment ever maybe, Jane, was when you said I was a lot like DeWitt Jones. I, I'm not sure there's gonna be much of anything that'll ever top that, so. Oh, Ryan, you, again, the Dempsey's got an open invitation. We, we got to make that happen. I would love to have you guys come up because uh, uh, I know you'd all appreciate it and uh, we could have some fun. Becky Rhodes has left us and said, thanks. I want to go explore Maine. So do I. So do I. Bev, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, it is my special place, and I'm happy to share it. Debbie Staley, wonderful presentation. That's your favorite place, Hilton Head. There you go. That's right. Keep looking for the, look at those same subjects and, and explore them, Deb, uh, especially when you return over and over again, because it's hard to make yourself go out when you realize, when you think to yourself, I already got that photo. I already did that. Oh, I got a really good photo. It's hard to make yourself go out, uh, but do it. Make yourself go out. Sometimes you just change your lens and say, I'm gonna use a seven to 200 all day. I'm gonna use a 50 millimeter lens all day. Um, and limit yourself. And in doing that, you actually grow. Keithy Bauer has left us. Yes, Lisa, we did some night sky stuff. The, the year that Bob watched it, we went right out on the riverbank and we shot the, the night sky right over the river uh, with some fabulous Nikon lenses. And we just, you know, 100 feet from the cabins, everybody was sleeping in. It was fantastic. Uh, so convenient, but also just so nice. Helen says, I was at Bosque de la Pache a few years ago. You were not able to make it that year, but I think, yeah, that's right. Keith was one of the instructors, and that was the year that uh, I broke my neck. So I'm very fortunate to even be upright doing photography at all, let alone anything. But that's too bad that I missed it that year because uh, 
Bosque del Apache is a very, very special place. There's, and again, that's a place where there's a lot more going on than just sandhill cranes. And you've got to go there with a big open heart, a big open mind, because it's a beautiful place. Oh, Mickey, that's so cool. I used to paint around Little River at Goose Rocks. Nice call. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. That's very cool. Just telling the story about how they, they spent a lot of time in and around Goose Rocks painting and that their daughter took them up and showed them around. They got to show them around a gunk with and Portland headlight. Um, yeah, the Rachel Carson here is really nice. Golden ferns. That's wonderful, Mickey. That's a great story. That's awesome. What a small world. What a small world. And I think that's our last comment. It's nine o'clock. Um, so why don't we uh, wrap it up and uh, I'll say good night. I wanna thank all of you for spending your Saturday night with me uh, and with Hunts. Um, hope to see you for any number of uh, webinars and classes in the future. Um, once things get back to normal, we're gonna get going back in the field. So be looking for photo walks and photo adventures and uh, with a lot of good fortune and uh, we're gonna get everything back up and going as soon as we can, uh, as soon as it's safe for everybody. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, again, I'm always here. You can always send me a note uh, or send a note off to Hunts. Uh, the Hunts Education Facebook page is very active. Uh, feel free to join, feel free to post some images on some of the photo challenges and ask questions. Um, but thank you. Thank you all very much for spending your Saturday night and I hope we get to travel again together very soon, one way or another. So everybody be well. I'm signing off. Uh, have a great night. Be safe, be healthy, and be creative. We'll see you again.